We got stuff done at the start of Dynamite. I don't even know what that means. Also, my friends, welcome to my very special and secret hotel here in America, as I do get ready for the last match musical, which kicks off at Friday. Some people have got in touch and said, Simon, are you nervous? I'm like, I'm not nervous. I'm not scared at all. But as you are, my buddies, I'll tell you the truth, I'm pretty much terrified. But I've still got the finger of power. This takes care of me. So it's time to give a good bit and up and a bad bit and down for the latest episode of AEW Dynamite. But yes, at the start of this episode, we did see a car pull up to the arena. And it was the Elite. I was like, okay, well, I've seen this before. They enjoyed driving their vehicles. But do you know who was right behind them? Jungle Boy Jack Perry. But when I saw this, I went, oh my gosh, it's flipping Jack Perry. And I was like, that sounds like Seth freaking Rollins. I didn't mean that. It's not Jack flipping Perry. Although I suppose you could call him that. But I'll tell you, if you are a Jack Perry fan, you've been saying to yourself, wouldn't it be great if an episode of AEW was totally themed around him? Well, just you wait and hear what happens at the end. We did have to move on, though, because it was time to find out which friend that Chuck Taylor was going to choose. Now, there's people out there that like to say, I don't like things like this. All of you, go away. This is my favorite wrestling. Certainly, it did start terribly, because even though Orange Cassidy's music started to play, Trent threw him out the entrance way instead. I was like, man, wrestlers love doing this. When he basically continued to stop around going, I do not like this guy, but Chuck Taylor, I really like you. Now, Taylor soon walked out here as well, and he was torn like Natalie and Brulia, when Trent just did a number on him, because he was like, Jimba Orange Cassidy, he was meant to be like our gimmick, but instead he came the main player in the Best Friends, and we just became his sidekicks. I don't like that. That's why you should join me and not him. I feel like Chucky. You can't join this guy. He clearly gone crazy. I mean, he essentially was calling a piece of fruit the main dish. So I started to chuckle because I am a loser. When he opened his arms and he extended the hug type movement in the direction of Taylor, because that's right. He wanted to have a cuddle. As you know, if you are in the best friends, when you do embrace that pose, it means you have to be pals for life. Let somebody comes and whoops your ass when you least expect. Now, Chuck didn't seem confused about this when we got the greatest payoff after five years of AEW TV because he was like, listen, Trent, I've made up my mind and you are a piece of shit. So he got to say it. And again, straight away, people go, oh, man, nobody's going to understand this reference. Well, I understand it. And other nerd fans understand it. And we are those nerd fans. So it's good for us. So why do I give a flum about anybody else? Trent then basically ran off as Taylor was like, I will fight you in the parking lot because he hasn't been cleared by a doctor. So now I suppose we're going to have to do a feud between Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy taking on Trent and a person I can't even think of right now. But listen. I have been watching AEW from the beginning. These guys are a bunch of OGs and it's just nice to finally break up the group and do a little bit different. I think Trent did have a reason for this here. He feels like Orange Cassidy has usurped him and he has been left in his, I don't know, orange trails. Whatever that means, but seriously, I am giving it up. I like everybody here. And I think if we give it some serious time, it's going to be pretty damn good. John Moxley was then here too. And he went and cut one of those promos. He just talked about the fact that when he does come face to face with Powerhouse Hobbs later for the IWGP title, it will be like being hit by a truck. He's aware of that and he knows it's going to suck. But he is Jonathan. And he's going to find a way to figure it out. There's also, of course, a Don Callis connection and he could interfere. But there's a reason everybody knows Moxley from Jacksonville to Tokyo. That's when he was looking at his championship belt. Because don't forget, he basically now rules New Japan. Seriously though, this was one of those promos where Moxie talks right from his belly and he has Eddie Kingston syndrome where you're like, I actually think he knows that pro wrestling is predetermined, but that just makes you believe in the character all the more. So I am just going to throw it up on it, because now that I think about it, AEW probably needed John to come back to the fold. So this is very well timed. When the joy continued too, because here came the brand new AEW World Champion, Swerve Strickland. I mean, it was just cool to see him as the champ because the guy totally deserves it. And Prince Nala introduced him here and he was singing and literally doing a dance and Swerve got such a good reaction. This man is going to fly. Don has one commentary as well because his boy Carl Fletcher was going to be taking on Swerve. They just had one of these one-on-one -on -one matches where you could take your tush, you could put it in a sofa, and you can bust out the popcorn and just say to yourself, you know what, professional wrestling can be pretty damn good. They sort of out wrestled each other until Swerve decided he was going to boot Carl right in the face. But even when Fletcher got back into this, do you know what he decided to do? Yell at Prince Nana, because wrestlers can't help get distracted. So eventually Strickland saw him and was like, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to hit you. And he did. From nowhere, Carl was able to bust out Mishinoko driver for a 1-2-0. When we did cut to the back, 
and we saw the entire elite with Jack Flippin' Perry going into Tony Khan's office. Now, one, you were meant to go, well, why are they doing that? And two, I was like, what cameraman <laughs> decided to cut to this in the middle of a dark match? I mean, he was essentially just watching a bunch of guys go through a door when we did go back to the fight in question and Swerve actually hit the stop on the ring apron. But this is why you don't do things on the hardest part of the ring because Strickland went and hurt his ankle. Rut row. I kind of jumped on that instantly, but actually turned out he got brain busted for another near fall. Where Fletch was just like, well, whatever you can do, I can do better. And he hit a tombstone. But of course he did. Don then started to yell at Carl, you need to get a weapon or something like that. And Fletcher thought about doing it, but you know the deal here. His goody two-shoe size got the better of him. He decided not to do it. And that was his undoing. Because Swerve came flying out the corner and took Carl out when he hit the Swerve stop. But amazingly, only got another one to ooh. But this was like a tease finish because then Swerve just hit the house call. He got the three and he held that title off like that's one. Damn it, I'm going to beat a lot more. You also probably have to imagine that we did do this because his eventual pathway is going to be to Will Ospreay. And we should probably do that match at all in 2024. Because can you imagine that in front of the London crowd? This is getting it up. When we got some delightful news because on next week's episode of Dynamite, Kenny Omega will appear because it is in his hometown of Winnipeg. And look, he's not going to wrestle because he has not been a well man. That's why when he does come out, everybody should cheer him because he has been through it recently and I do hope he is okay. And also, he's just such a good dude. I watch some of the streams he does and I really appreciate the way he talks. We do not appreciate Kenny Omega. Rennie Paquette was then here with Thunder Rosa because she wanted to talk to her about the pay-per-view. Mostly because she went out there and had a banger. Now she didn't want to offer up any excuses, even though she did get whacked right in the groin. And essentially, Diana Perazzo came walking into this. She yelled at Rosa. Rosa yelled back at her when they had to be separated by security. So there you go. Been teasing it for a few weeks. And that is going to be the next program. I thought about this. I ran it through my brain device and I realized, nope. I don't have a problem with it. AEW then also made sure to go back to Dynasty as well because they had this video telling you about Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. And not only should they do that today, they should do it next week and the week after that and into 2027 because the constant message going into people's heads should be this was one of the best matches ever, which it was, by the way. And we should turn it into like a grand thing that we always go, oh my gosh, do you remember that time when Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson did fight? But seriously, if you haven't seen this, why are you watching me? You should go and check that out instead. When it was time for Mina Shirakawa taking on Anna Jay. I mean, why not? Now, this, of course, was after Mina and Mariah May had got back together a couple of weeks ago. And Excalibur told us about the history there. They had been a super duper good tag team in stardom. And now they have found their way to be together again. Now, Mina is very good as well. She showed that here when she went after Anna Jay's knees. Understandably, Anna was like, well, no, I need them to walk. What did she do? She kicked her right in the head. Anna was also worried about going into the figure four, which is when she raked the eyes, when she gave Mina what I could only describe as like a rope neck breaker. Once again, I thought about this. And I was like, well, if you are going to break somebody's neck and you can get some help, you should always ask a friend. What? They then just started to trade when Shirakawa absolutely ruined Anna with this big discus lariat when she carried it on by taking her knee and ramming her right in the chest. Somehow, though, Anna Jay came back with that with a gory bomb for a one 2 ooh. And I was like, it's wrestling tennis. She also did it again, like Britney Spears, because Jay was able to escape the glamour drama right into the Queen's Slayer. But this is when Mina had enough. And she was like, listen, I have been studying US pro wrestling. And she basically hit the most devastating move. In all the sports, and attempted surprise roll up. One, two, three. I should also point out too, that was after Mariah had cast distraction from the outside. Because I've already told you, wrestlers cannot handle this. And they forget they are in a wrestling match. I tell you, right after this, we got a big old angle. Because Anna Jay was so mad, she started to beat both of these guys up. But of all the people who came out to make the save, it was Tyler Tony Storm. I was like, well, it's finally happened. She now appreciates Mariah May. Much like we should all appreciate Kenny Omega. I'm saying it twice. Of all the people, though, it was Serena Deeb who came out to kind of balance the books. And she held the title off like, man, I want a piece of this. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to give it up to all of this, as well as Serena Deeb going for the championship, because it will be good. But the more, I don't know, sensible part of my brain has to give it a down. Because what happened to the rankings, I don't even remember the last time I saw Serena Deeb on Dynamite. It's not like I super duper care or anything. I'm not going to go to bed going, oh, I'm so mad at AEW. I just think sometimes they could have more fun with this. Like we could have done some backstage segments with Timeless Tony Storm and Deeb when Serena's like, listen, I think you're totally insane. And Timeless Tony Storm will be like, oh, darling, you don't understand the movies. They said, sometimes, as we've talked about before, 
stuff just happened. So we carry on the women's division focus too, because it was time for the Willow Nightingale is the TBS title championship celebration. Try saying that when drunk. I still have the way was talking here first. They had just come from the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant where they were also celebrating. And he basically compared Willow Nightingale to a Bill Withers song because her winning the TBS title was like a lovely day. That's like, what a nice thing to say. Chris Lander also read out a poem, which I think started described as two packs of ass when we did invite Nightingale to the ring. She just looked so happy. And the fans treated her like she was the greatest person ever. Well, Nightingale is going to become a megastar. Have the way they made me laugh because he went, hey, I didn't like you at first, but like a fungus, you grew on me. Willow did agree that she didn't like Stokely either. So now I'm hoping the original plan was that they were going to break up. But now AEW's realized that these three do have good chemistry. We can ride it all the way to the bank. Nightingale once again was just so overjoyed about the fact that she had signed for AEW a few years ago. Now she is the TBS champion. When Britney Spears happened, because Mercedes Monet did it again, she came out and she stole Willow's thunder. And Nightingale was done with this. was like, listen, Mercedes, if you want to say something to me, you should say it. And Monet was like, okay, I will. I don't think you should be doing any of this because it's null and void. Because in 32 days, it is going to be double or nothing. I am challenging you, meaning you ain't going to be the champ anymore. Shots fired. Mercedes also thinks that it was probably Willow that attacked her when Chris Statlander got involved and was like, we don't even know if you were attacked at all. When Stokely also threw his two cents in, he just threw Julia Hart under the bus when it was definitely her. And the main idea we're trying to get across is now Mercedes is not 100% sure when she did have this NJPW match with Willow that Nightingale didn't hurt her for real. Whereas Willow was all like, no, I did not. And in fact, when I went to my hotel, I had doubts in my brain because, like, can I defeat Mercedes Monet when she's 100% healthy? That is why this TBS title match is so important to her, though, so she can prove it to herself when Mercedes was like, ah, ah, you know you can't beat me, child. I'm going to whoop you. Kristen acted like she may attack Mercedes because she grabbed her arm. But because Monet wasn't looking when she turned around, she decided, I bet Willow did this. And she slapped her right round the face. Cue the madness. No one was kicked off before everybody did calm this down and we separated people. And I think this is the best thing we have done with all of the people involved in this. And you want to know why? Because Mercedes was clearly the heel. Willow was clearly the face. And that's just the dynamic that works. So it is a massive shame that Double or Nothing is so far away because what we desperately need right now is Mercedes is in the ring, but the countdown is on. And again, I thought this gave us a good direction about where we are going to go. Mostly I just enjoyed it. Therefore, I shall give it an up especially because Mercedes should win, but also Willow shouldn't lose. So what in the flub are we going to do? We then cut to Alex Marvez, who was indeed outside of Tony Khan's office, and he tried to get a word from the elite. Surprise, surprise, they ignored it. Now, Matthew Jackson was kind enough to give a few words, and he basically said this. Tony Khan has agreed to meet Jack Perry in the ring later. I was like, <laughs> I'm sure that's just a ruse. But look at my face. Does it look ruse-worthy? No, it does not. We will talk about it. When apparently... <laughs> It was time for the Casino Battle Royal International Title Challenge. What? Where did that come from? And there were some serious names in this too. And actually, I thought the idea of the thing was really great. But there was no mention of this beforehand. And it was barely promoted. And once again, that just made me a little bit sad in my tum because AEW is not having fun with this stuff. You could have built this for the past three weeks and I would have been so hyped. So once again, going to be a geek and give it a down. But aside from that, my gosh, this was crazy. Because Jay White and Dante Martin did start when the rules were explained to us. And that's it, that it is sudden death. So people are just going to keep coming to the ring until we get a submission or a flipping pinfall. It also meant soon we got pen to Kyle O'Reilly when Will Ospreay ran to the ring. <laughs> that's what I always had an aneurysm. I was like, yep, we definitely should have put this somewhere on a poster or on the internet. Lance Archer also got involved before Commander was here. That's when I worked something out. I was like, well, this definitely isn't based on win-loss records because the poor mask guy never wins. Now Lance used that to go totally crazy because he basically grabbed Will Ospreay and did a blackout onto the entire pack when he just started setting up tables. I was like, well, at least he's taking his opportunity. Commander and Will honestly then went at 100 miles per hour in a sequence that made no sense to my brain. It was proper 2 plus 2 equals potato when Jay White and Osprey faced off. And this crowd knew exactly their history and everybody went mad. So now we're going to have to go and do that match. Osprey was also able to reverse the Blade Runner into a Liger Bomb, which just told you why people wanted. When Jack Lethal also enjoyed this. I was just laughing away. I was like, who came up with this list? It then turned into the whole you hit me, I hit you, we all hit each other bonanza when everybody was just reversing and transitioning and countering everybody else's maneuver. That's why I just sat down. I started clapping like some kind of a seal. 
because I couldn't quite believe what they were all doing. This was so damn fun, it should become a yearly thing. We also had some story here too, because Will Ospreay was going to do the Tiger Driver before he remembered, oh no, I crippled Brian Danielson with this, so I shouldn't do it. But that error did cost him, like it does all wrestlers, because all of a sudden Kyle O'Reilly had locked in the armbar when Commander shot out from the side of the screen, and he did a shooting star press. That's when I went through the wrestling move book and went, yep, they've done them all. That also benefited Osprey because he was able to wang Commander with the Hidden Blade to get the one, two, three. And we wasted no time here. We were not standing on ceremony, Mr. Wayne, because Roderick Strong and the Undisputed Era did come out. And I add the pay-per-view, it's Will Osprey versus Roderick Strong. And put your hands up if you do want that. My hand stays up. You really should check this out, though, if you like adrenaline and roller coasters. That's the only thing I can compare it to. We've already talked about the downs. So we don't need to go back to it, but I do stand by it. But also, in terms of just enjoying myself, good grief, it gets it up. When <laughs> I laughed out loud. Now, I don't know whether he had this at the pay-per-view or not, and I missed it. But Chris Jericho's brand new entrance music starts with him shouting, I am the learning tree. Like, yep. I'm watching Sesame Street. He is clearly leading into all of this stuff, though, because the whole point is he knows better than everybody else, which is what some people on the internet have been yelling at Chris Jericho. So, yeah, I kind of think the more you do this, the more he is going to do this. He also got booed out of Daily Place as he told us that he's changed the name of the FTW title because it now stands for For the World Championship because he did this for all of us. I've been thinking about that for the last hour. That doesn't make any sense. He also then started talking about Terry Funk, who apparently years ago had told Chris Jericho he should go out there and be a tutor, which is why he is doing it, when he said, listen, Hook, you've got a bunch of great qualities, but I tell you a couple of bad ones, that you hang around with Taz, and you hang around with Shibata. And I'm like, Taz, eventually you've got to choke this guy out. Chris also blamed Hook for the fact that he made him hit him with a bat, which is interesting logic, as he also talked about the Jericho Vortex, when of all the people, like you knew somebody was going to interrupt, and I presume maybe it would have been Hook, but it wasn't, and it was Big Bill. Huh. This was super funny because he made Chris Jericho look like a child. Obviously, he made me look like a kid as well, but seeing it visually just made me giggle. And, of course, the big surprise is just it looked like Billy Boy was going to tell Chris Jericho to go to hell. He said, no, Chris, I would love to learn under your learning tree. I can't say this with a straight face. This sounds like I'm talking about kids' TV. And, look, I am really pleased that Big Bill is involved in a big angle on Dynamite because he deserves it. But I just kind of think we're going back to the past here because obviously there was Enzo and then there was Ricky Starks. The man is super duper tall. I think eventually he can stand on his own two feet. His major selling point about why he should be entered into the learning tree group is that he is bigger than everybody else, which is a fact. And Jericho at first didn't accept him and basically said, sure, man, I'll take it under advisement. All of this is fine, too. I don't think it's necessarily bad. When I am watching it, it's just not clicking with me. and I don't understand it. So if this is for you and you're enjoying it, if you could let me know in the comments below, I would appreciate it. Because I even went back and watched this twice. And yeah, I just say it again. I don't get it. So I'm just going to give it a down because maybe I am stupid. I do appreciate the fact that Chris Jericho is listening to criticism and trying to turn it into a story. I suppose that story is just not for me. Will Ospreay was then about to be interviewed when Don Callis walked in. And Don was annoyed because he was like, why didn't you do the Tiger Driver, man? As Ospreay pointed out, well, one, I talked about it at the press conference. But two, Kyle O'Reilly has only just come back from a broken neck. It doesn't sound like a very kosher thing to do. Ralph Fletcher then walked in because he wanted to help Will when Don Callis eventually said, you don't get to say anything because you're a massive loser. So I can see what we're doing here. I bet Will and Carl both leave the Don Callis family and basically pick up where they did leave off in New Japan. Once again, I thought about this and I said to myself, you know what? I think that's fine. When it was our main event for the evening, we did indeed get an IWGP title match on the show. Because it was indeed powerhouse Will Hobbs taking on John Moxley. And while the first couple of minutes were big men slapping man meat, when we got to the second half, I don't know whether William got injured or something when they were fighting on the outside. I did get that insinuation, but I may just be being a geek. We've already discussed this. But something just felt missing from this. And once again, I've been scratching my head trying to figure it out. I can't. I mean, at one point, Moxie also gave a German suplex to Holes, but he just stood up like, man, you can't do nothing to me. And this is when they did go to brawl in the crowd. And when we came back from the advert too, it was just William throwing him around. But then he hit the paradigm shift. He got a one 2 ooh When John locked on the bulldog choke, Powerhouse Hobbs just passed out. And that was it. That's why I started to go, man, maybe he was hurt because that did just end. So maybe I'm just tired or something. Maybe something's going on with me. But once again, if you can believe it, 
I just didn't get it. I also think it suffered a little bit because the IWGP title was on the line and a certain kind of expectation does come with that. And I know John Moxley can hit those heights. And I totally believe that powerhouse Will Hobbs is able to hit those heights as well. But in terms of this match on this night, I feel terrible saying it, but it does have to get it down. That's not because their work was bad. Again, they're two very talented wrestlers. But in terms of the spectacle, where my level of expectation was, there's that word again. Well, it just didn't hit it. Look, they ain't trying to entertain me. Doesn't actually matter what I think, but I have to be honest with you, that's just what I thought. Once again, if I am wrong, please steer me in the right direction. Kestra also came out afterwards to look at Moxie too. So obviously we're going to do that match at one point, which I have no problem with. When Shibata also challenged Chris Jericho to a match next week because Jericho had insulted him earlier. So I'm going to predict this right now. Chris will win after interference from Big Bill when we get the first member into the learning tree. I can't do it. I'm going to have to call it TLT or something like that. The name just makes me laugh. And there wasn't a lot of time left on Dynamite at this point. That's when I remembered, oh yeah, Jack Perry has to come to the ring. And oh my word, this was absolutely bonkers. So Jack Perry admitted that he had missed AEW and that he wanted to see Tony Khan when out came TK, meaning he was about to do some kind of story stuff on TV. I don't think he's ever done that before. Now, Perry put his hands up and said, listen, I know we've had our ups and our downs. I was like, thank you for shouting me out, even though he totally didn't do that. It's definitely a saying. But as we have got here, why don't you just bring me back into AEW and we continue doing what we always have been trying to do, which is change the wrestling world. And bless this Tony. He lit up like a Christmas tree and he shook Jack Perry's hand and they hugged. This is when Jack looked at the camera and he smiled. I was like, Khan, you've got to get out of there. As I point out, the fans chanted, cry me a river here. And Jack did get a big response. So this all-in footage has worked in that sense. And of course, just as they were celebrating, Perry took his fist and he punched Tony Khan right in the stomach. Even though I'm an elderly gentleman, my jaw dropped to the floor. I couldn't believe it. It made me scream, we are not in Toto anymore, Kansas. And thankfully, the elite then ran to the ring. But this is when the Young Bucks started to pick up Tony Khan and flood me sideways. They were going to give him the EVP trigger. Where thankfully, Okada saw sense and he stopped them. But he must have whispered something in their ear because instead, they put him in the Meltzer driver position, which is now called the TK driver. And yes, I kid you not, they did this move to Tony Khan and left him basically dead on the floor to the point his father even came out to check on him, along with a bunch of baby faces. Not in my wildest dreams that I ever think we were going to do anything like this, but the reason it was so good is because the elite have told us time and time again, hey, we're running the show now. I suppose in the world of kayfabe and the world of reality, but don't need to worry about that. The only person stopping them from running amok was Tony Khan. And yeah, they just went and killed it. I just never would have called this. I'm going to say it again. I can't quite believe it, but that means it must have been a good angle. It must have been a good story, especially because I just want to run on the internet and talk about it. And in terms of making me want to tune in next week, Bob's your uncle. Everyone has said recently, too, my gosh, AEW needs to start taking risks and start taking chances that they are going to build their audience. And this, as far as I'm concerned, is exhibit A, especially because I doubt Tony Khan ever does anything like this again. And if he does, it will be years in the future. And you also have to ask the big question, what are the ramifications? So I'm going to give it an up, but I'm also going to say this. If it goes the way that I think it will, I may return to this in six months and give it a golden up. This is the kind of stuff that AEW definitely should be trying. So I am giving it a massive round of applause. One of the best endings of Dynamite Ages color me intrigued. It also brought us to the end of the show and I do admit I felt at times this one felt a little bit disjointed just because there was so much randomness but when you went on this much of a high you are getting it up. Now of course please do let me know in the comments what you thought about this. I'm sure it's going to divide opinion but that's what's good for the world. Like the video, share the video and subscribe. Click the video on the screen which is ups and downs for all but otherwise thank you for joining me my friends. As I keep saying supporting me as I do go on my adventures. I appreciate it a lot and I will see you soon.